Let's see what I'm going to call it. Yes, Pastor. Well, glory. I'll tell you, I'm glad to be right here this morning. Good to uh, see so many of you this morning. And how God has been so good. I want to thank you for praying for my wife and I. And uh, we still chucking along. We're not doing too bad for people 83 years old. Some of you say, well, I thought you was about 39. I tell that a lot of times, but I think people know it's not true. But it's certainly been looking forward to this special day, Pastor Appreciation Day. And I know you love your pastor, and I do too. And uh, every week, my wife and I, we get a note from him and always a verse of scripture. I don't think you've missed a week. And we do appreciate that. And many of you others have been sending cards. And thank you so much uh, for your prayers and your cards. Many times, and I'll just give a brief report on this, but many times you feel good and things that can be going good. And I was in northern Virginia preaching a revival. Church I'd never been to before, run four or five hundred every Sunday. And we were just really having a good revival. We had already, Sunday through Monday, I think it was, we'd already seen nine people come to Christ. It was just good. Singing was good. Preaching wasn't half bad, but God was just blessing, and it was a great, great time. But on Tuesday morning, when I got up, I knew something wasn't just right. Uh, this left arm just kept on going in every direction, and I wasn't telling it to do anything, but it was just moving. I felt like at that time I was having a mini stroke. But I knew if I said anything to anybody that they would say, well, you got to leave. You go to the hospital. It was too good a revival. I didn't want to leave. So I just kept on preaching. And uh, after uh, we finished up on Wednesday, and then I, uh, I went home. And that being two or three preachers that I knew that was there I had called my wife. And said, what's going on with Brother Earl? I know he's not drinking, but he's making some funny moves. <laughs> so uh, anyway, like a good wife does, as soon as I get home, she shoots me right to the emergency room. And uh, while uh, we were there, or I was there, she got word that she had cancer, melanoma, one of the worst kinds. Most of the time, melanoma is from the outside. She had it on the inside. Found out there was a spot on the brain, on her liver, in her back, close to her kidney. And uh, uh, it, it was active. We went to UVA, and they told us that it jumps from one place to the next. So we just have been praying, trusting the Lord. And uh, she's playing the organ at Clifford Baptist Church this morning. And uh, I just finished a revival last week and here this week. And uh, so both of us, we just keep going and serving God. And uh, I want to thank you for your prayers. Three weeks ago, I was in Logan, West Virginia. And uh, they scheduled me for revival, but I told them I, I'll not be able to stay for revival, but I will preach on Sunday. So uh, while I was there, my wife was able to go with me. I don't leave her very long uh, because I know that this can take a life at any time. But uh, while I was there, it was 50th uh, yeah, anniversary for the church. 
they had booked me three years in advance just to be there. So I had looked forward to coming. And it was a great day. They did make me feel kind of old. They gave me a plaque and said, you have not missed a preaching a revival here for 30 years. So, uh, anyway, after church, they, uh, they told me that, uh, that they, uh, we'd had many souls saved during those 30 years, and it was a good day. But two doctors in the church told me, and this is what really bothered me, <laughs> they said, you got to stop preaching. Said, you had a mini stroke, but the next one's going to be a major stroke. And said, you'd better stop preaching. Well, I thought about that for 30 seconds, and I, <laughs> and I said, man didn't call me. God called me. So anyway, I told my wife, and she said, well, maybe you ought to consider that. Now, this is the way God knows how to get your attention. We were driving back Monday on Interstate 64. The speed limit is 65, 70 miles an hour. I was driving that speed going down the interstate. And all at once, I heard the pow. And my wife said, you've hit somebody. <laughs> That'll make you feel good. So I pulled over to the side, and the truck that we had met <laughs> pulled over. And he come running back. He said, are you okay? I said, yeah, how about you? I'm okay. And to my surprise, I looked at my car. There was not a scratch on it. I was expecting his to be all caved in. We looked at his. There was not a scratch on it. The only thing we could ever figure was our two mirrors must have hit at 70 miles an hour. But God spoke to me through that. Yeah, I checked him out, made sure he was on his way to heaven, so I thought maybe that's the reason it had happened. But this is what really had God spoke to my heart. He said, when I'm finished with you, I'll be the one to let you know. I'm the one who called you, and I'm the one who's going to keep you in the pulpits preaching. Amen. So that was the news that I wanted to hear. I called both of those doctors up and I said, I got, I got a little message from heaven. <laughs> Don't worry about me. I'll still be going and preaching His Word. Friend, there's nothing any greater than this book. We are to learn it, we are to live it, and we are to love it. Because it's God's precious word. And there's nothing as powerful as this. Take your Bibles and let's go to the book of St. Mark, chapter 1. The book of St. Mark, chapter 1. <clears throat> Let's start at verse 28. And only God knows where we'll stop, but let's start there. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region, round about Galilee. And forthwith, when they were come uh, out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and Amon, or immediately they tell him of her. 
And he came and took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. And at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils. And all this city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of divers' diseases, and cast out many devils. Suffered not that the devils to speak, because they knew him. And in the morning, rising up a great while before the day, he went out and departed unto a solitary place and there prayed. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the pastor, this church. I thank you for the men, the ladies. I thank you for the choir, the good music that we always hear here. I thank you for the good fellowship, Father. Father, there's not many churches like this one. They still preach your word. They still teach it. They still see souls saved. God, we give you glory and praise and honor for this church. God bless these people today. Help our hearts to be open, receptive, that we will hear from heaven this morning. And Lord, you'll get all the glory, the praise, and the honor. We love you. Thank you for first loving us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I love this chapter. It's so much here. And you know, as I, uh, I, I was just, have thought about this many times. Why is it in the scriptures that he mentions a sunset and then two verses later, he's talking about a sunrise. And when we think about those times, a sunset, it represents the day is coming to an end. Whatever that we have done, when we get to the sunset time, there's not much time left. Daylight is ending. But then we take for granted so many times, hey, sunrise, hey, sunrise. I'm an early riser. I love, I love to get up early. That's my time of prayer. That's my time of study. That's my time of preparation. It's early in the morning. I'm not sure my wife has ever seen a sunrise. <laughs> she doesn't get up early. She sleeps late. And since her illness, a little bit of mine, <coughs> she comes to this study. And we sit there every morning. And we just talk about how God has blessed us and that family and how he's been so good to us. And he's given both of us a ministry. Hers is music and mine is evangelism now. And had and we thanking him and praising him. If he took us home today, hey, no complaints, just praise us. So we spend so much time, 30 minutes, sometimes to a half, and we just testify about the goodness of God and the grace of God and precious souls that we are seeing being saved. She finished one of her treatments a couple of weeks ago uh, at, the, at the hospital and, and she was just testifying to everybody in there. How God's so good. She said, cancer's not going to win. God is the one. I'll either get, get healed here or I'll get healed up there. And when she said that, here comes some woman, I guess she worked there, come out from another room and came out and she said to my wife, I need to know your God too. Amen. No mistakes with God. Isn't it amazing so many times we'll look at things that have come into our life. 
But we better realize if we are in the will of God, all things are working together for good for those who love God, who have been called according to His purpose. It's working. It's working. It's still working. Thank God. I had a preacher call me, I don't know, a few weeks ago, and he said, I feel so sorry for you. I said, why? We feel sorry for me for? Oh, I don't know why God lets you have a stroke. I said, I'm glad he didn't give me what I deserved. He'd have kicked me in hell a long time ago. But he's been playing good out. Listen, I bet it was in revival last week and we saw some souls say, let me just tell you about one. It's a man that I had witnessed to many, many times. Tried to give him. Great big guy. Oh, man. Lynn, I think he said it was 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, said he weighed over 200 pounds. I said, yeah, I bet you weigh four. I mean, great big guy. Great big God. We had witnessed and witnessed and witnessed to him, talked to him. But something happened. He called me on a Saturday night. He was crying. He was weeping. He said, my 50-year-old son just died. We weren't expecting that. He had a heart attack. He said, he was my only son. And he said, Preacher, I am so tired of running from God and I need to run to Him. Is it any way I can get saved over the phone? I said, you can get saved right now. He said, I don't want to put it off any longer. I want to get saved now. Praise the Lord. Man, he got gloriously saved. I think it lined me up to baptize him on the 27th of this month. And, 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 and you listen, listen, many times, many times, it takes something like that to get our attention. Friend, there is nothing any greater than, than uh, the gospel that he has given us. Look with me in your Bibles in verse 38 and 39. And he said unto them, Let us go to the next town, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. Hey, Jesus himself said, That's the reason I came. I came to seek and to save. I came to preach the word of God. Oh, my friend, how can we not preach this book. Amen. There's no book like that. Amen. It works. Many of y'all heard my testimony. I preached all over the world. I preached in many, many foreign countries. But I have never, ever preached that I didn't share the gospel. And to God be the glory, I've never preached in a foreign country that souls were not saved. Amen. Why? That's the reason he came. That's the reason we preach. That's the reason he preached. To seek and to save those that are lost. You know what my biggest concern is? My biggest concern, that so many today have church membership, but they don't have Christ. Oh, what a difference when Christ comes in. Amen. We're never the same again. Man, when we get born into the family of God, you don't have to beg people to go to church. They'll come. Why? There's something alive on the inside called the Spirit of God, and He is constantly drawing us to Christ, making us more like Christ, teaching us, guiding us. I fell in love, I fell in love with all this book. But in Psalm 48, Verse 18. The psalmist is saying, You'll be my God forever, forever, forever. Now watch here. And you're going to be my God in this life, even unto death and forever. Whew. 
That'll make old backslidden Baptist shout. Amen? What is any better or greater than knowing you got a home in heaven and knowing that every day God is guiding us? I may shock you. It's no surprise that I'm here this morning. God laid it on my heart. And it's a special day. Day of pastor appreciation. And you love your pastor here. Thank God. He preaches the word. Thank God. Brother Bill, thank you for the kind words that you shared about the hours that no one down here ever keeps up with. That Brother Walter said. Why did they do that? He was trained by the best. No, no, no. <laughs> I had to get that in. Amen? And if it ever stops, you call Brother Earl. I'll know how to straighten him out. Amen? I love Brother Walter and Wendy. They're so special to me. I love his church. This, and I mean it, this is my favorite church to come. I mean, you're loving people. The music is always great. The preaching is always great. Even this morning, okay. The power, the power from this book. Why is it that we don't use this continually in our witnessing? Why is it? Why is it we just read it and many times think it's for somebody else? Let me tell you what. This is for you and I. This is for us. Oh, I love, I love all of it. Look with me in verse 14. And after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee. There it is. Doing what? Preaching what? The gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Oh, my Lord. What a powerful verse of Scripture. Amen. Repent. Don't we all need to do that every day? Don't we need to look at our failures and sins that may creep into our life and repent? But watch it and believe the gospel. Believe the gospel. But look at 16. And he walked by the Sea of Galilee. I've been there. And he saw Simon and Andrew and his brothers cast it and led to the sea. They were fishes. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you become fishes of men. Woo! Man! Ha. Ah, wouldn't you have loved to have been there? Amen. Wouldn't you have loved to Say, come on with me. I'm going to make you become fishers of men. You know how to throw a net. You know how to do that. You've, hey, you've got patience. You've got the knowledge in knowing how to catch fish. But I, watch it, watch it. I'm going to make you to become fishers of men. Whew. Two weeks from now, no, three weeks. I got a wedding in two weeks. But in three weeks, they're getting 40-some men together. And they just want me to come and charge a battery. Can you do that, Brother Earl? I said, I can give them a word. Jesus is a battery charger. He's the one that sets hearts on fire. He is the one that will make a difference. Friend, look at the 
privilege that we have. I cannot find anywhere else in the Bible where he talks about that you'll be wise. You'll be wise if you win souls. I don't know why I did because my wife pushed me into doing it. But we got two cemetery lots. White side by side. She's got hers. I got mine right beside. And she asked me a while back, well, what do you want me to put on your tombstone on the plat here? You want me to put evangelist? You want to put my reverend? I said, don't put either one of those. I want one thing. He was a soul winner. He won people to Jesus. He won people to Jesus. That's all. Remember me? Just remember, I was a soul winner. That's my calling. That's what I desire. When I had my stroke, the preacher was leaving, and they said, Brother Earl, would you come be a pastor? We run five, six hundred every week. I said, no, I can't. Well, why can't you? Why can't you? That's, I'm not called to be a pastor now. I'm an evangelist. I go from church to church to church preaching that gospel. My granddaughter Tiffany told somebody the reason he's evangelist, he never could hold a job in one church, so he has to go to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> she might be right, I don't know. Oh, friend, the power of the gospel. And then there is great power. Now, watch this. In believing, in believing, sometimes we see a lot of people say, well, I believe some of the Bible, but I don't believe all of it. I said, well, you know, I'm glad to meet you. I can show you what I believe. Show me what you don't believe in the Bible. I've never had one of them yet to be able to turn and show me. They may tell me what somebody told them, but they cannot find it in the Bible. That's power in believing. Power in believing. I expect every Sunday, every meeting, that somebody's going to get saved. I believe it. He said, does that happen? Most of the time, sometimes it may not. Oh, maybe it does, and I just don't see it. Amen. How wonderful when we believe the Bible. Then we get, as, as Pastor taught this morning, then we study it and we learn of the precious promises of God. Oh, how precious that they are. Precious. Man, I was telling you about, he's up in his 70s that, that I led to the Lord over the phone. If we will open our hearts and our minds to this gospel, we will see great and mighty and wonderful things happen. How wonderful it is. I try everywhere I go to leave at least a track. I'm not able, Bobby, to talk to everybody. Those I can, I do. But I try to leave a word. Why? I got a promise. It's not going to return void. God is going to speak that little simple track that I uh, wrote many years ago, if you only had five minutes left. It's amazing how many people 
that's come to Christ from reading that, that I know about, that I know about. I was at the funeral home uh, this past week. Somebody came up to me and said, Brother, you don't know this, but somebody gave me your track. And I prayed and I asked Jesus to save me. And she said, that's probably been 15 years ago. I said, are you still saved? She said, oh yeah, oh yeah. Active in my church, serving God, singing in the choir. I, whew, that's what fires me up. Amen. That gets me excited when I can see that fruit. I preach a lot in Northern Virginia. And I was reading in a restaurant, Johnny Appleseed. And Johnny Appleseed was known for one thing, planting apple seeds and then seeing trees grow. And you know, I love apples. I got a dear friend that works at an orchard. And he loads me down with apples, and if they get too ripe, I give them to the horses. But I love apples. But every apple has a seed. And that seed, if it's planted like Johnny Apple seed, you're going to have trees growing everywhere and, and fruit on all of those trees. Look, as Christians, what happened if we will be faithful and sowing the word of God? It's going to be fruit. Souls are going to be saved. Lives are going to be changed. Family members are going to be saved. I think I'm, i got to wind down. I hear a couple of them stomachs growling, but... But then there is, in closing, a great power in one's testimony. Amen. In one's testimony. Oh, look at verse 44. And he said unto them, See, thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, offer for the cleansing those things which Moses commanded thee for a why did testimony? But look at verse 45. But he went out and began to publish it much so it blazed abroad the matter in so much that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was out in a desert place. And they came to him from every quarter. Amen. Wow! Did you get that? He told us that. They got to say, hey, you don't go to tell nobody because I won't even be able to get into the city. But the Bible says he went and told everybody. Yeah. He tells us to go and tell them many times. We don't go tell anybody. What a shame. All we need to do is we'll just go and tell them about Jesus. He will take his word, the gospel, and he will send it forth into heart. I'm going to ask you today. Maybe you're here without Christ. Get saved this morning. Oh, Lord, get saved. I could have got killed. So is my wife and I both. 70 miles an hour. A truck. Bam. Hits my wound, my uh, mirror and his, and yet didn't get damn it. We both of us probably missed death six inches. Could have happened just like that. I don't know. I might not get home today, but I know where my home is. And I know where I'm going. And I've got peace about it. 
And glory to God is nothing in it better. That guy 75 years old, he got saved this way. He said, now, I can see my son. Please, if you're here today without Christ. But listen, I got another request. Maybe you're here without Jesus, or you know Jesus, but you're not telling anybody. You just think it's enough, come sit on a pew. No witness. Don't share the gospel. If you're saved, God didn't save you just to sit on a pew. He saved you to be a witness. And you know, Brother Walter, I believe when a person really born into the family of God, the first thing you're going to want to do is tell somebody. You won't tell somebody. Why don't we do it? Why don't we do it? It's enough people right here this morning. This morning. Can you imagine what would happen if everybody told somebody and that somebody told somebody and those somebody's told somebody else? You know what would happen? Let's have revival start. And that's what we need. That's what the world is, is hungry for. Something real. Not something out of Washington, but something from the Word of God. Amen. That's real. Be, be real today. Be real today. Listen, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, please, I beg you, open your heart up. Let him in. If he is there, he wants to use you. What would happen this morning? And I'm getting ready to close. The preacher said that 10 minutes ago. The chicken is still there, I promise you. But watch it. What would happen today? If everyone here said, Preacher, I can give tracks out. Preacher, I can tell my neighbor. I can tell some members of my family. Preacher, I can tell people that what People, I will do that for Jesus. That's all that he asks. If we'll just do that, he'll do the rest. It's like old Johnny Appleseed. If we'll just sow the seed. Oh, how he waters. And God will do the rest. Every head bowed, every eye closed.